Well, good morning, Parkway. It is so good to see you here in person. If you're joining us online, it's so good to have you as well. And I just want to say, it's been so good to just be able to worship together this morning. Can we just give a quick round of applause for Grant and the team? Don't they do just a phenomenal job? Like, it is so good to be able to have our eyes fixed on Jesus through worship, declaring his worth, his glory, that there's nobody like him, that that's why we get to come here this morning to be able to describe his worth and his value. And I just love being able to do that as a church family together. And, you know, today is a really special day because we're starting a brand new series today in the Gospel of Mark. And I want to just take a moment to tell you why we've titled the series the way in which we've titled it. You see, for us here at Parkway, when we talk about our year, we have what we call our ministry year, which begins in September, and it goes the whole way through August. And last September, if you were here, you remember that we kind of launched our yearly goal or our yearly focus. And the way that we described what we were praying for over this next year was simply this, is that together we commit to seize the moment to move the mission forward. And I got to tell you, so far in the first three quarters of this year, it has been an incredibly exciting year. We've seen our church grow from people coming to faith. We've seen our church grow as people have taken a step of obedience and are, have been baptized. We've seen disciples made and multiplied. And what we've been watching happen is the gospel go out into our city and to see our city loved by followers of Jesus. And we're only three quarters of the way into it. It means we still have one more quarter to go. We have June, July, and August, and we have some incredible things that we're praying for and asking God to do over this next quarter. Now, if you've known me for any amount of time, you probably know that I'm a big college football fan. And if you don't know this, you should know that there are only 83 days until the first college football game of this next year, which means there are only 90 days until the Longhorns kick off, all right? So that's important for you to know. But one of the things that I love about college football is there's this kind of ritual that's happened over the years. And if you follow it, you know that in the fourth quarter, you know what happens? That when you get into the fourth quarter, players, coaches, fans all do this one thing where they start to put their four fingers up into the air like this. And what they're saying when they put their four fingers up into the air is that this is it. This is it. You need to lay it all out on the field. You are never going to get this opportunity back again. So make sure that you give it all that you have, all that you have, because you're not going to get this time back again. And very similarly to that, the writer of Hebrews, when he writes to the first century church, he's writing to a church who had endured incredible persecution they endured incredible difficulty. They were tired, they were struggling, and they were in their fourth quarter. And through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, here's what the writer of Hebrews said to the first century church. He said, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The writer of Hebrews is saying to these first century Christians, he's saying, it is the fourth quarter. Don't give up. Do not lose heart, but fix your eyes. Make the attention and the focus of your life be on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, the founder of our faith. Don't give up is what he's saying to these first century Christians. And the exact same thing is true for us as we enter into the fourth quarter of this ministry year. That there is an opportunity that we have as a church to fully live out the goal for this past year, the focus of seizing the moment in order to move the mission forward. That as we think about June, July, and August, there is an opportunity in front of us for our eyes to be fixed on Jesus. 
And I realize that today there are some of you who are tired. There are some of you who are exhausted. And when you think about entering into the summer months, you're thinking to yourself, like, can we just, like, be done with it already? There are some of you, the kids are home now. And you're like, please, like, can I hibernate? Could I just fall asleep and then wake up in, like, three months? There are some of you who over this past year, it has been a difficult, difficult year. And the thought of being able to keep on keeping on, you're thinking to yourself like, no, no, it's time for summer. It is time to take a vacation. Now, there is nothing wrong with resting. There's nothing wrong with taking a vacation. But sometimes, sometimes when we get into the summer months, there's a temptation that as our routines and our rhythms change that we take a vacation from Jesus. That we get out of maybe a routine or a rhythm of spending time with him. Thinking about our neighbors, thinking about our coworkers, thinking about the need for the gospel to go out. And what I just want to say as we start this series is we don't ever want to take a vacation from Jesus. We want our eyes, just like the author of Hebrews is saying, we want our eyes to be fixed on him. Because he is the pioneer. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. And so that's why this summer, over the next 11 weeks, we're going to be focusing in on the gospel of Mark. Because in the gospel of Mark, Mark introduces us to the life and ministry, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but throughout my life, I've never regretted spending time fixing my eyes on Jesus. I've never been disappointed when my life's aim has been to focus or to fix my eyes on Jesus. And in order for us as Parkway to finish strong, this is what I want to challenge you with. This is what I want to encourage you with. This is what I hope inspires us over the next 11 weeks, that Jesus would be our aim. That he would be our one desire and we would allow him to transform us from the inside out. Now, whether you've been following Jesus for a long time or you're just kind of curious about Jesus. Someone invited you today, you're tuning in online and you're not quite sure. I want you to know that wherever you're at on that spectrum, today is a great day. This series is a great day for you because we're going to spend time going deeper with Jesus and getting to know Jesus. I love what someone said about the Bible is that the Bible is deep enough for theologians to drown in, but it's shallow enough for babies to play in. And so no matter where you're at on this spectrum, Jesus is inviting us to look at him in the gospel of Mark. Now, one of the things that you need to know about the gospel of Mark is that it was written by a close associate of the apostle Peter, and it's written primarily to a Gentile audience. So that's the majority of us, where in contrast, when we look at Matthew's gospel or Luke's gospel, you'll see the further teaching of Jesus, or you'll see more editorial comments in the gospel of Luke, because they're trying to describe it and explain it, reaching back into the Old Testament to make sense of how Jesus is fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. And so because of the Jewish audience that Matthew and Luke were writing to, they had to do some different types of explaining in order to connect to that audience. But the gospel of Mark is written primarily to a Gentile audience. So they don't need to do, or Mark doesn't need to do as much back work. He's bringing the truth and the reality of Jesus right in front of their eyes. And one of the things that you're going to see as we open up today into the gospel of Mark is that when you look at Jesus in this gospel, You cannot remain neutral when it comes to Jesus. Whether you've been following him for a long time or you are just curious about him, you will have to make a decision about Jesus. You're going to have to make a decision about who he is. You're going to have to respond to what he's done. You're going to have to respond to what he says about you. And ultimately, you're going to have to decide whether you're going to follow him and keep following him because it's impossible to remain neutral about Jesus. Now, I love, you got to know this, I love the gospel of Mark, and that's not just some vain thing because we've got the same name, but I love the gospel of Mark because the gospel of Mark clearly shows us Jesus's identity and how Jesus's identity shapes his activity. And that is one of my prayers for this series is that as we begin to understand our identity in Christ, that we understand the beauty and the good news of the gospel, that gospel, kingdom-oriented identity will actually shape gospel activity in this world. 
that will be transformed people because we know who we are in Jesus and that transforms how we live in this world. So I want to invite you to open up to Mark chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 1 and let's allow Jesus and who he is to change our perspective and our activity in this world. Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 1, reads like this. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now pause there for a moment, because there's 12 words, and these 12 words really matter. In fact, these 12 words, what they're going to help us do is they're going to help us to fix your eyes. They're going to help you to fix your eyes on Jesus' kingdom identity. Mark wants you to see clearly who he is. He's going to get you to fix your eyes on Jesus' kingdom identity. And in these first 12 words, what Mark does is he launches us into defining who Jesus is. And in these 12 words, it actually forces you right away to make a decision about Jesus. Because what Mark is saying is that if you believe in Jesus, you actually believe that he is the son of God. Now that's a big statement. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And when you believe, if you believe that that is who Jesus is, that that is his kingdom identity, then that will change your purpose. It will actually change your identity. But if you don't believe, if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then the words that Mark is saying right here, they are ridiculous and they are delusional. They're not even worth the price of the paper that they were printed on. Because either he is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, or he isn't. Now, as we look at how Mark opens up his gospel, many commentators will reflect on how it alludes back to the way Genesis begins. And the way Genesis begins, Genesis says, in the beginning. And Mark says here, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what he's doing is he's alluding back. And so what he's saying through this, there's a way in which Mark is saying, what I'm about ready to tell you. The story that I'm about ready to tell you, the person that I'm about ready to introduce you to, the one who created this world is about ready to recreate your understanding of your life in this world. Because this world was dramatically broken, but he's coming to bring a recreation that maybe you haven't been introduced to. You see, this Jesus that Mark's describing is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is what the world has been hungering for. Jesus is the one who is going to bring life, and it's a life that this world has needed. And what this world has needed is for someone other than themselves to deal with their sin problem. You see, because right at the very beginning of the creation story, we know this from Genesis 3, that man and woman disobeyed God, breaking their relationship with God. But God loved humanity so much that he had put into play a purpose and a plan in order to rescue and redeem man and woman to himself. And what Jesus is going to do, Jesus, this Christ, the Son of God, he's going to bring healing He's going to bring hope, and he's going to bring salvation to this world because of who he is. Now, I don't know about you, but that's what I call good news. That when we are able to see the brokenness in us, not only vertically in terms of our relationship with God, but when we see the brokenness all around us, and come on, you know this, you don't have to look very far. You probably don't have to look beyond what took place in your house this morning to understand that there's brokenness not only in this world, but in your life. And that within that brokenness, God has sent his son to heal that brokenness. Not just in you, which is a really, really good thing, but in our world. Now, gospel, the word gospel, it's a word that you hear kind of sounds like a churchy word, doesn't it? Gospel. But gospel means good news. Good news. And when we think about what Jesus is bringing to this world, there's not a better word to describe it than gospel because Jesus is bringing out the best news that this world has ever heard. It's good news. It's really good news because we see that God will not allow this world to sit being darkened, damaged, deceived, and seduced by sin. You see, it's good news because God is intervening in this world through his son, Jesus. Jesus, who is the pre-existent God. This is Jesus, the creator, the sovereign one, almighty God who has come to us. 
And Mark wants to make it abundantly clear so that even in these first 12 verses, you don't have to question or wonder what he's saying about this Jesus. A couple of weeks ago, I was outside playing with my kids and my wife comes out and she had to run somewhere for like 15 minutes and she says, hey Mark, I've got a coffee cake in the oven. The timer's gonna go off in about 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, can you go inside and take it out? And I said, yeah, sure, no problem. So I'm out playing with my kids. She comes back like 15, 20 minutes later and she's like, did you take the coffee cake out? And I just kind of gave her that blank stare like, what are you talking about? And she's like, ah. So she goes in, gets the coffee cake out. About a week later, um, I'm with my kids again and she says, Mark, hey moron. No, she doesn't say that. <laughs> she says, I've got some cookies in the oven. They're gonna be done in about eight minutes. Look at me very carefully. In eight mu- minutes, that buzzer is gonna go off. Can you please remember to take them out of the oven? I said, yes, dear, you are awesome. But she, what she was doing there, she said, I wanna make it abundantly clear what I'm asking you. I wanna make it so clear so that you don't forget what I'm telling you. I wanna make it so clear that you know exactly what the expectation is. And that's what Mark is doing here as it relates to Jesus. He's saying, I wanna make it so clear, even in these first 12 English words that is translated into English, but these first 12 words, so that you know, that you know, that you know exactly who Jesus is, not just what he's claimed to be, but what he's proved to be. And this is powerful. And we have to deal with it because what Mark's going to show us here at the very beginning of Jesus's life is he's going to paint a picture for us that's different than the other gospels. You see, Mark is not going to begin with Jesus's genealogy. He's not going to begin with Jesus's virgin birth. He's not going to begin in the manger or during Jesus's teenage years. What Mark is going to begin with is Jesus being obedient to his heavenly father. And then what his father has to say about him. You see, at the very beginning of Mark, during this time, John the Baptist, he was out in the wilderness baptizing people. And he was calling them to turn from their external religion and their internal sin. He was calling them to follow God with all of their heart. And what John the Baptist was doing is he was fulfilling prophecy that had been written about him by Malachi and Isaiah saying that there is one who is going to come. There's a messenger who is going to come that's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. And right away, Jesus shows up to John the Baptist as he's out baptizing people. And he says to John to baptize him. And John, they kind of have this awkward exchange. And John's like, don't you, like, don't you think you should be baptizing me? And Jesus is like, no, no, it's okay. And what Jesus is doing, the reason why Jesus needs to be baptized here is not because of Jesus' sin, but because Jesus wants to fully identify with the sinners he came to save. You see, because God the Son incarnated, meaning he went from his high God's seated standard, and he didn't leave the godness behind, he just brought it to earth, where he was fully God, but yet fully human. And he completely related to us, even in our sin condition, that he was willing to go through baptism, not because he was sinful, but because he wanted to completely identify with you who were stuck in sin. And as Jesus comes up out of the waters of baptism, the text tells us that the Spirit of God descends on Jesus like a dove. It rests on him. And in verse 11, Mark tells us this, and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. And it's in this powerful moment that God the Father is affirming He's declaring and defining the unique sonship of Jesus, God the Son. And God the Father tells Jesus that he's his beloved son, that he loves him. And he wants to make it abundantly clear that he loves his son. And then he puts an exclamation point on it by saying, with you, I am well pleased. And the verb that God uses here, it indicates that God is pleased. God the Father is pleased with his son at all times. That God has a delight in his son. God the Father has a delight in God the Son. And it never had a beginning and it will never have an end. That's how pleased he is with his son. Now those are powerful, powerful words from a father to a son. 
Dads, would you just look at me for a second? Your words matter to your son. Your words matter to your daughter. The words of a father are powerful. And you can use them to build up or you can use them to create incredible amounts of destruction. But God the Father, speaking to God the Son, tells him he's pleased with them, that he loves them. I love how Dr. Don Howe comments on this section. He says, the baptism of Jesus, accompanied as it is by the Father's clarification of his identity, by the Spirit's empowerment of his work, underscores the perfect harmony of the three persons of the Trinity in the redemptive program. The entire act is properly interpreted as the formal commissioning to his public ministry. And it's right here in the preparation for Jesus' ministry that God's spirit will lead Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And as Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days, what Jesus is gonna show us is that where the first man, Adam, failed when tempted by sin, Jesus will be victorious. When the nation of Israel wanders for 40 years in the wilderness because of their sin, where they fail, Jesus is gonna be victorious. And he's gonna be victorious because of who he is. Because he's the Messiah. He's the son of God. He is the king who's bringing his kingdom to this earth. And that's what Mark is showing us. He's showing us that through him, Mark, the associate of Peter, an eyewitness of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And what Mark is saying stands in stark contrast to the secularism of our culture. You see, the popular belief in our culture is that there is no such thing as absolute truth. That truth is more of a buffet that you eat whatever you want to eat. That your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. And the highest character quality that we have in our society is the character quality of tolerance. And tolerance just simply means that I won't try and convince you of my beliefs and you don't try and convince me of yours. You believe what you want and I believe what I want and that perhaps somewhere in this place of tolerance, we'll find a perfect, beautiful, happy neutrality. But do you know what the problem with that is? Is that it's not true. That it's not true. Like it's impossible to find this happy neutrality because the moment your belief system rubs up against someone else's belief system, neutrality ends. It's impossible and it's impossible when the king of the universe clearly exclaims who he is. And that's what Mark is confronting us with here. That there is no happy neutrality when it comes to Jesus because the truth of Jesus matters. The truth of who he is matters. And you're either going to fix your eyes on his kingdom identity or you're going to choose to look away and negate what he said about himself. But here's what I want us to see this morning, is that as you fix your eyes on Jesus' kingdom identity, you're also going to have to fix your eyes on Jesus' kingdom invitation. Because there is an invitation that Jesus has for all people. Turn with me and look at verse 14 to verse 15, because here's what, Je here's what Mark tells us as Jesus comes out of the desert. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now watch this, because this is really important. When Jesus says the time is fulfilled, here's what he's saying, is that everything, Everything in Old Testament history, all the prophets, all the priests, all the kings, all of it, all the judges, all of that stuff that happens in Old Testament history is like one giant neon sign, one giant finger pointing to the Messiah, Jesus. That's what he's saying. He said, everything is fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. And he's saying, I am the fulfillment of everything that's been written. Now, that's a bold claim. And you cannot get around the exclusivity of what Jesus says here. Jesus is not just some nice prophet or teacher or good man. He either is what he said he was or he is one massive liar. And he's saying, 
the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus is saying, I'm bringing about that kingdom because I'm that king. Now, I want you to see something here that's so important. You've heard me say this before, but I want to repeat it because what Jesus' claim here is, is it's incredibly exclusive. It's an exclusive claim. But his invitation into the kingdom is absolutely inclusive. Absolutely. And what he's doing in this claim is he's inviting all people to repent and believe in him. And this is good news. It's the gospel because he's the king who has come to save. And his invitation is for every single human being, regardless of race, gender, or nationality. Jesus' invitation is open to everyone, regardless of past decisions or present circumstances. But I want you to listen carefully. You cannot embrace Jesus' kingdom invitation without fully embracing how that kingdom invitation defines you. That's why Jesus says to repent and to believe in the gospel because there is no such thing as faith or belief without repentance. There's no such thing as faith without a humble confession of deep personal need of a savior. Now why do you need a savior? Why do you need a king? I hope I don't offend you too bad, but it's because you're incapable of ruling yourself. Like it's impossible for you to save yourself. You can't fix yourself. And I know you've tried, I've tried. But you can't fix yourself. No amount of therapy, no amount of self-help, no amount of working harder is going to fix yourself. Only Jesus can fix you. Only Jesus can change the direction of your life. You see, when Jesus says to repent and believe in the gospel, what he's saying, what repentance is, is repentance is here's you, you walking your way, saying, I'm going to do my will, my desires, my way of doing things. And you come to the place where you realize that your will, your way is broken and that you can't do it. Repentance, which is a gift of faith from God, says, no longer can I save myself because I am not righteous, but I need the righteous one to save me. And I turn by faith and say, I need a savior. And now I'm walking with you, Jesus, because you are now the king and ruler of my life. That's what repentance and faith looks like. It's a gift from God. They go together. Repentance and belief cannot be separated. They are married together. And in your life, sometimes you'll experience repentance and you'll turn. And what happens in that moment of repentance, God saves you. He justifies you. He declares you righteous, never to be taken away from you. You cannot lose that salvation. But in your life, in your experience of life, you'll turn and follow Jesus. And as you do that, you're going to say, Jesus, you know what? I'm going to take a break. I'm going to do my own thing now. And in that, God, by his grace, convicts you. And he says, no, no, that's not the way of life. And you turn back. And then you do it again. And then you turn back, and then you do it again, and then you turn back, and what Jesus is doing is by his grace, not only has he justified you, but by his grace and his Holy Spirit inside of you, he's sanctifying you. He's making you more and more like himself. So the question for you today is, where are you? Is have you believed this message, this gospel good news message that Jesus is the king? You are not. Only he can save you, and it's time to give your life over to the king who can save you. Amen. Have you come to that place? If you've never come to that place before, can I just tell you that it's not an accident that you're here today? It's not an accident that you're watching online. Only Jesus can save you. Repent and believe. He came to this world to die for you because he loves you. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. He's calling out to you today. Don't leave here today without repenting and believing and finding the author of life, this Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah. Now, if that is you, 
If you've come to a place of repentance and belief, and I know there's those times where you're back and forth, back and forth, but I want you to see something powerful about Jesus. I want you to fix your eyes, not just on Jesus' kingdom identity, not just on his kingdom invitation, but on Jesus' kingdom activity. Because for Jesus, who he is, his identity, shapes his activity in this world. And my hope and my prayer that as our identity is formed in Jesus, that his activity will become our activity. That we'll live the life that Jesus has for us in the world that he's created. Now turn with me uh, to verse uh, 16. Because here's where we see Jesus' kingdom activity. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And the first thing that we see here about Jesus' kingdom activity is that Jesus' kingdom activity reveals purpose. It reveals real purpose. You see, as Jesus approaches Simon and Andrew, he approaches them not because, that he, not because he wants something from them, but he wanted something for them. You see, for Simon and Andrew, Simon later being called Peter, what they had done for the entirety of their lives, which many of you have done, is that they had given their lives to making a living. They were trying to put food on the table for their families. They were trying to put clothes on their back. They were trying to put shelter over their head. But when Jesus comes on the scene and he invites them to follow him, Jesus is saying this, no longer is your life going to be about making a living. But your life is going to be about showing other people how they can have life. You see, I'm going to take what you do as your occupation and I'm going to transform that so that the gifts and blessings of God can be taken in your life and multiplied so that more people can come to know my heavenly father. He's saying, I see something in you, not because of who you are, but because of who I am. Because remember what Ephesians 2.10 says. Ephesians 2.10 says that you are God's workmanship, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And Jesus is drawing that out of these early disciples. And he's saying to them, you are God's workmanship. You are God's masterpiece. But as you follow me, come on, as you follow me, I know your past. I know where you failed. I know where you're messed up. But that's not going to deter me from calling you to follow me. No, 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 no. Because when you follow me, I transform your life. I transform your desires. I transform your heart and your mind. And I can take whatever is broken and rebuild it into something beautiful for my purpose. You see, when God calls you to follow him, when you're his, he doesn't want you just to make a living He wants to use you to show other people how to have life. So what does that look like for you? What does it look like for you to be involved in Jesus' kingdom activity in this world? Well, here's what it looks like. That whatever gifts, whatever resources, whatever abilities, wherever God has placed you, where you live, work, learn, and play, he wants to use you right there to make him known. Because your life is not just about making a living, but it's about showing other people how they can have life. You have a new purpose in your life. That's what Jesus' kingdom activity produces in you. But that's not all. Look down with me at verse 21. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribes, And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread and fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And here's what we see: is that Jesus' kingdom activity reveals power, real, authoritative, exercising, healing, Holy Spirit power. 
In fact, in just a few verses, we're going to see Jesus healing all kinds of sick people, all kinds of demon-possessed people. And it's because of this. It's because God the Son is operating under the full influence of God the Spirit. And it has powerful effects on people's physical as well as their spiritual lives. And what Jesus is showing his disciples, what he's showing you and me, is that if you are going to operate in his kingdom, if you're going to have a Jesus kingdom activity in your life, it means that you can no longer operate under your power. But you have to operate under the full influence of the Holy Spirit, meaning that you depend on him for everything. Because you cannot love like Jesus loves without Jesus loving through you in his Holy Spirit. Come on, you know this is true. You cannot love your spouse without the Holy Spirit transforming your heart and mind. You cannot love your kids without the Holy Spirit transforming your heart and mind. You cannot love your neighbor, your coworker, fill in the blank, unless the Holy Spirit is working powerfully through you. And as a disciple of Jesus, your activity in this world is to be marked by the power of God's Spirit. And God's Spirit works and moves through you, not as you depend and believe in yourself, but as you wholly rely and depend on the King of the universe. I love how Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 2. He says, I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a, here it is, a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom but on God's power. Jesus says to his disciples in John chapter 15, apart from me, you can do, hear this, nothing Some of us need to be reminded of that. I need to be reminded of that more often. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing of spiritual fruit and power. We need Jesus to do that in us. And so here's what that means. Is that apart from Jesus, you cannot do what he's calling you to do. Apart from his spirit working, you cannot host a Bible club this summer. That bears fruit unless you're relying on the Spirit of God. You cannot love your kids like Jesus would love them unless you're relying on the Spirit of God. You cannot share the gospel unless you're relying on the Spirit of God to do his work in and through you. And here's the beauty of it. Come on. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Come on, we forget this. The same Spirit. He lives inside of you. Like he's there. The moment that you believed. And so often we negate the spirit of God inside of ourselves because we believe the lie that we just need to pull up our bootstraps, do a little bit harder, try a little bit harder when we have access to the spirit of God moment by moment, day by day, right here, right now. That's who you have inside of you. Now watch what Jesus does here. Because after a powerful evening of healing and casting out demons, look at verse 35. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place and there he prayed. And I love this. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him and they found him and said to him, everyone's looking for you. And he said to them, well, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Now, here's what we see here, is that Jesus' kingdom activity reveals prayer. Now, if I'm Simon in this moment, I'm like, what are you talking about, Jesus? Like, there was all this crazy stuff happening last night. Demons were being cast out. People were being healed. We got to get back after it. And where's Jesus? Jesus has removed himself in order to connect with his father. Jesus has removed himself from all of the activity to do the activity that matters most to him. It's being connected to his heavenly father. He goes to a place of solitude to be silent. Now I want you to see something here that is so powerful. That in order to have a kingdom mindset, In order to have a kingdom identity that fuels kingdom activity, it requires us to have kingdom prayer. A place in our lives where we are connecting with our heavenly father so that we know what kingdom activity he wants to lead us into. And this is one of those areas that when we think about summertime 
and taking a vacation on Jesus, this is one of the easiest areas to take a vacation on Jesus because it requires you to change some things in your life and to prioritize spending time with him. But if you don't spend time with Jesus, you can't expect to have a kingdom priority mindset. And I want you to see what Jesus is modeling for his disciples. Jesus is prioritizing what matters most. It's the first thing that he does in the morning. And when I think about spending time with Jesus, do you know what one of my greatest excuses is? And maybe you can relate. You know what I'm going to say? I'm too busy. I've got too much to do. I'm too busy. But come on. You will always prioritize what you value most. So if busyness has been an excuse for you, it's a bad excuse. It's a bad excuse. Because you will always prioritize what you value most. And if you value time with your father, because that's where you find life, that's where you find kingdom perspective, then you will prioritize it. And maybe a step for you today is to not just prioritize it, but to prioritize it with someone else in your life, to have them hold you accountable, to do it with you, because it's what matters most, time with your heavenly Father. You see, for Jesus, it's this kingdom priority that leads to a kingdom prayer, that leads to his kingdom activity. Now look at what happens in verse 40. And a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling and said to him, if you will, can you make me clean? Jesus moved with pity. He stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. You see, Jesus' kingdom activity reveals pity. Now this word pity that's used here in the ESV version can also be translated compassion. Or the Greek word here, it means that his guts hurt. That his insides hurt. Or another way that this word can be translated is the word anger. And you may think, well, that's kind of weird, but what's happening here is Jesus is angry at the effects of sin in this world. His emotions, his heart is stirred up because he sees the sin-filled world and the destruction that's there. And what that does for Jesus is it moves him to disregard cultural norms and religious rules, and he touches the untouchable. He steps outside of what culture will deem acceptable and he moves towards this man when everyone else has been moving away. That's what kingdom activity looks like for Jesus. And I wonder today, I wonder today, who is in your life that needs this kind of pity? Who is in your life that needs compassion? Who is in your life That maybe Jesus, through his spirit inside of you, is pushing you. He's pulling you. He's motivating and inspiring you to say, you know what? I need to see this person the way Jesus sees this person. I need to move towards this person because that's the type of person Jesus would move towards. That it's no longer about my will, but it's completely about his will. You see, it's Jesus' kingdom identity that fuels a kingdom activity, and the same thing is true for us. You know, when we talk about discipleship here at the church, if you've ever gone through our guide, you've maybe seen this image, because this is what we see in Jesus. It's an identity that fuels an activity that reinforces the identity. That's what it means to be a disciple in Jesus. It's your kingdom identity that fuels a kingdom activity that reinforces your kingdom identity. That's why Paul says in Galatians chapter two, verse 20, I, here's the identity, I have been crucified in Christ and it's no longer I who live, identity. But the life I now live in the flesh, activity, I live by faith in the son who loved me and gave himself up for me. Identity fuels activity. Now, I don't know what your summer looks like. I don't know what your plans are, but I wonder what this summer could look like if you fixed your eyes on Jesus' kingdom identity. That that was your focus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 
I wonder what this summer would look like if you fixed your eyes on Jesus' kingdom invitation, not just for your life, but extending that kingdom invitation to other people's lives. And I wonder what this summer could look like if Jesus' kingdom activity was your activity, that that's what you gave your life to. I wonder how your life would be transformed. And I wonder other people's lives and how they would be transformed because of Jesus' identity working through your kingdom activity in him. Well, I don't know about you, but I am excited about the gospel of Mark. I'm excited to have our eyes fixed on Jesus, and I hope and I pray that you will join us for this journey, that we will hunger and thirst for him, and that we will seize the moment to move the mission forward. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you that you are the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Thank you that you are our Savior. Thank you that there is nobody like you. And I pray today, Jesus, that you would help us to have your identity because we've accepted your invitation and that your identity would fuel a kingdom activity in us so that we would live for your will and your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.